In case you missed it, Mark Hampton's a free man. Amen. Been praying for you for a long time, buddy. About now, now it's time to get busy. Come on. When my dad passed away a few years ago, one of the things he left me was this trusty old pocket knife. I value it and cherish it to this day. It's really just a beat up old pocket knife. My dad really loved this knife. He carried it with him everywhere. We got hooks on our knives, but this was old school, so he had it in his britches like this, and he'd carry it with him everywhere he went. This was my dad's knife. He must have cared for his knife a lot, because to this day it is still the sharpest knife that I own. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22 says that a good man will leave an inheritance to his children and their children. What is it that makes a good inheritance? Is it a knife? Is it a lot of money? Maybe it's some property that you can leave. J.D. Rockefeller, over the course of his life, was an oil tycoon, a a business magnet, uh, an industrialist, and a philanthropist. And he is widely considered uh, compensating for uh, uh, today's uh, inflation to be still the wealthiest American of all time. Yet he once wrote this about wealth. said, the poorest man I know is the man that only... Has, has nothing but money. King Solomon knew a little bit about money. He is estimated in today's market to be somewhere uh, in the, uh, his wealth was estimated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two and a half to three trillion dollars, which by the way would put him ahead of Jeff Bezos and, and all of the other guys today. Matter of fact, that would make him the richest man who ever lived. Uh, The Bible also says that he was the wisest man in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 16. But if you read the first three chapters of Ecclesiastes, here's what he said. He said, I have come to realize that there are things more valuable than silver and gold. And he concluded that chapter in Ecclesiastes verse 12, uh, chapter 12 and verse 13 with this. He said, this is my conclusion. That is this. Everything I have been taught can be summed up like this. Fear God and obey his commandments for this is the entire duty of mankind let me paraphrase that for you love and serve the Lord this morning we have uh, three sets of parents that are with us today Brian and Jen Litton David and Jamie Chesky and Alex and Ashley Blamodel who have come to dedicate their children to the Lord years back there was a popular bumper sticker that used to see on cars all the time and said we're spending our children's inheritance nobody ever bought that sticker and flew that did you okay my dad thought that was the funniest thing he used to have that uh, uh he, he he just he loved that that was just the funniest thing he ever heard he used to tell us kids he didn't want us to fight over things after he left so he was doing everything he could to spend everything he had before he went and he wasn't kidding I mean he literally was not kidding because uh, other than this trusty old pocket knife he did not leave me anything of monetary value but all oh, my friend I did inherit some things somebody say man I did inherit some things What are you going to leave your kids? You say, well, it all depends on what I got left. You know, the inheritance I'm talking about this morning is not what you leave them after you go. What I'm asking you today is what are you leaving them right now? Because what they're getting from you right now is more important than money uh, or any property or any material things that you might leave them later on. Because all those things uh, are temporary and what you're pouring into them now will affect them eternally. You see, every day our children, young and old alike, are inheriting things that help shape the way they see the world and see themselves and help to form the basis of what they believe and how they behave. Three things I want to lay on your heart this morning, and I 
Pray that you'll take them home with you and you'll keep them forever. Your outline is on the back of your bulletin. I encourage you to follow along if you would and take some notes. The first thing I want you to know today is this. Number one, your children will inherit your principles. Uh, Some first graders were asked to draw a picture of God uh, one Sunday in Sunday school. One of them drew a picture of a rainbow for God is love. Uh, Another drew him as an old man in a white beard coming out of the clouds. Uh, One little girl uh, pictured Uh, God as Superman, but the best pick was a child who said, I don't know what God looks like, so I just drew a picture of my dad. How many dads do we have in here this morning? Raise your hand if you would. We've got a few, okay? We've got a few. Amen. I'm going to ask every father in here this morning, when your children look at you, do they see God? When your children look at you, do they see God in you? Then whether you realize it or not, we are called to be the spiritual leaders of our homes. And we are responsible for and accountable to God for how we lead our families and how our children are raised. Do you know what accountable means? Uh, The word accountable means somebody who is answerable to or somebody who is, in fact, culpable, meaning God has some expectations upon our lives uh, as men. Moses told the people of his day in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verse 1, and then verses 6 through 9, he said this, These are the commands and decrees and regulations that the Lord your God has commanded me to give unto you. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them upon your foreheads as a reminder and write them on the doorposts of your house And upon your gates. God says there's some things that he wants us to pass on uh, to our children. To give our children. There's some things that we need to teach our children. And you say, well, you know what? What, Where do I begin with that, preacher? Because this is a very, very big book. Well, yes, it is. Uh, And so where do I start? And what do I focus on? Well, there are three things that I want to give you this morning. Three things I want to help you with. Uh, Why don't we start off by teaching them that there is a difference between worshiping things uh, and worshiping God. Somebody say amen. There is a difference between worshiping things and teach them to uh, to develop a relationship with God. Did you know that it's possible uh, to have religion? And by the way, everybody worships something, believers or not. For we all have within us a vacuum uh, uh, that, that seeks to worship, that seeks to focus on something. And everybody worships something. But did you know that it's possible to have a religion and still be headed to hell? There are many people in the world today that have religion, and some of them just enough to inoculate them from a relationship. We are to teach our children uh, that God loves them and that God wants a relationship with them. By all means, when you're teaching them, please do them a favor. Uh, Don't let them buy into this modern message that there are many ways today to enlightenment and many different ways to God. And we must learn to be accepting of all of them. Uh, If we are to be loving people, we must be uh, tolerant or we will, in fact, become intolerant and bigoted people. For my friend, this militant group uh, uh, push for groupthink, I believe, is in part what is killing our kids today and killing our culture. For it promotes a rejection of biblical truth and biblical values disguised uh, as love and tolerance. So teach them the importance of truth. uh, And being spiritually correct, not being politically correct. Teach them that there is one God. Somebody say amen. There is one God. And there is one way to heaven through Jesus Christ, his son. Teach them to revere the Lord and to serve him with gladness. And let me let you in on a little secret when you're doing that. Before you can teach a child to love the Lord, to love the church, uh, and to honor his word uh, and seek after his word, Those things uh, have to be treasured in your life as well. They do. What I'm trying to say is that uh, don't expect your kids to believe something you don't. And don't expect your children to be devoted to something that you're not. Now before we go any further, and just so we're all on the same page, I'm going to ask you a question. Do we agree that when children are born, they are absolutely, I mean, I mean, they cannot take care of themselves. Uh, when they come out of the womb, uh, uh, they are incapable of surviving on their own. Uh, and other than instinct, uh, they are born a void of any knowledge of good and evil. They learn those things. Uh, they just come out and they're just there and they need to be taken care of. And if that's so, uh, whose responsibility is it? 
to take care and teach uh, your children how to live. Contrary to what some have said in the past, uh, it's not a village's job. Matter of fact, I don't want the village today raising my children because they might grow up to look like the village people. Somebody say, man. Okay? I don't want the village raising my kid. Uh, it is the responsibility of a parent to raise their child. Uh, and if it's our job to teach our kids, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, that comes from an over 30-year teacher in the public education system that said it's the responsibility of a parent to raise their children and not the teachers and not the schools and not the villages. Somebody give the Lord praise. Amen? It's our responsibility as parents to raise our children. And if it's our job to raise our kids, and by the way, even if your children are adult and have grown, uh, uh, excuse me, have grown and have moved out of the home, I believe as parents that our job changes, but our job still stays the same because we still can influence our children into their adult years as well. But if it's a parent's, if it is a parent's job to teach and influence, uh, then we need to learn how kids learn. I want to ask you, right out of the gate, how do they learn? Well, when a little one is born, it's very evident. uh, One of the first things you know about a child, a baby, is how alert they are. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that they remain alert throughout their lives. Uh, Meaning they are always watching and learning from us. Parent children are always watching their parents uh, and maybe looking from afar or looking up close. But they are always watching and learning from us. So I want to ask you this morning, what are your kids learning from you? I've shared this illustration in the past, uh, but it remains one of the best illustrations I know on how we can influence our kids uh, by our actions. Years ago, I was a patrolman for the sheriff's department here in Berrien County, and I responded to a uh, a disturbance of a teenage girl and her mother. I arrived there, and I engaged the mom in a conversation, and in the midst of that conversation, the daughter chimes in and begins cursing at her. Her mom, and the mom turns around and says, hey, you better shut your mouth and don't you blankety blank blank blankety blank 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 blankety blank me. You better shut your mouth and don't you curse at me blankety blank blank. Now, I don't condone the way that a, 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 a child was speaking to her mom. I don't condone But I realized right there that that is what she had grown up with. It's what she had le- or lived, and therefore, it is what she had learned, that in stressful situations, our family, uh, this is how we react. And as, dis- as dysfunctional as that was to me, uh, it was normal for her. You see, the apple fell right at the bottom of the tree, and it didn't roll an inch. There's a passage in Scripture that says the sins of the Father are visited upon the second and third generation, meaning things that happen in one generation tend to repeat themselves into the next. And this mom was teaching her daughter how to argue and how to yell and how to, and how to curse uh, even in front of people. It didn't matter. There were no boundaries. She just didn't realize the effect that it was having until it began having an effect on her. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. Children learn from our habits. And that's why Paul said in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5 that we Christians are to live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most out of every opportunity. One translation said we are to live uh, wisely towards them that are without wisdom. And if that's how we are to live towards people who are outside of the faith, then how, how much more should we do that uh, and live wisely among uh, our own kids? Because kids don't start out with wisdom. Nobody does. They acquire it. They learn it. They develop it. And so God says that we are to model it in front of them, meaning we are to live like Jesus Christ would live. We are to do business in the community like Jesus Christ would do business. We are to treat others like Jesus Christ would treat other people. We are to be people of integrity and honesty, and we are to live with a sense of decency. Somebody say amen. That's the kind of people God has called. Recognizing that our family is watching and inheriting our principles. And hear me clearly, hear me very, very clearly, that your children will see the real you that nobody else sees. And they learn uh, 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 by repeating and imitating what they see. And so if you're going to talk the good talk, you have got to walk the good walk. How many in here has ever said a curse word? All right, we'll open the altar because we got a bunch of liars. I used to have a problem with my language back in the day. I used to have a salty mouth. 
And I chalk it up to anything. I was, uh, I was a police officer for a while. I went to drill sergeant school. I was in the military and yada, yada, beat your chest, yada, yada, bam, 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 whatever. But I had a salty mouth. And by the way, your excuse is uh, whatever. I had a salty mouth. It hurt my children. It affected my children. You want to know why? Because my children heard me say that I was a Christian. And my walk did not match my talk. Ironically, I told my children that they could not have a salty mouth. Matter of fact, if I heard them cussing, I'd wash their mouth out with salt. And salt, glory to God. Right? They couldn't do that, but old dad could do it. Which, by the way, is illogical. And your children know that. And it didn't make sense. And so it hurt. It hurt my kids. Paul says we're to model Jesus in everything that we do. And that's really what a dedication service is about. It's about these parents, Brian and Jennifer, David and Jamie, Alex and Ashley coming here to stand before God to commit yourself to being Christ-like examples for your children, for the children that God has given them. And so today, you're committing yourself to a huge responsibility. The Bible says that little Leah and Phoenix and Everly have been entrusted to you by God. And so I challenge you, I challenge you this morning to stay faithful to the Lord and stay focused on the task before you. And if you will, then you have a pretty good chance of your child growing up someday to come and know, uh, to know and love the Lord that you have come to know and love. But this message is not just for these three sets of parents. It's for every person in here today, every Christian parent or not. I challenge all of us to stay faithful to the Lord. Amen? Live wisely among those who are watching us. Walk the walk, especially if you have children or grandchildren, for they are watching and be Christ-like towards everyone. And if you will, we will succeed in the mission that God has given, for, uh, given to us. But it takes more than just promises and pledges. It does. It takes a commitment because it takes a lot of work. It's hard work to do that. Let me share something with you when it comes to kids. And you will... Learn it now or you'll discover it later. Lip service doesn't cut it when it comes to your children. Lip service won't cut it when it comes to kids. Why? Here's why. Because your kids do not care how much you know if they do not see that you truly care. They don't care if you don't care. So I challenge you this morning to make a commitment to show your children that you care. And, and, and patiently nurture them. It takes a, a, and it takes a pledge to faithfully raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And in that passage of Scripture, nurture always comes before admonition. You see, if you, if, if you give them rules before you develop a relationship, rules uh, before relationship will always lead to a rebellion in your children. And so we need to love them. We need to raise them in the nurture, the love, uh, and then the direction of Almighty. God. Nurture is important. Love can never be uh, subjugated uh, to admonition. And like I said, it doesn't just happen because we make pledges and promises. It's hard work. Meaning in order to raise a child, it takes a lot of prayer. In order to raise a child, it's going to take a lot of patience. But a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and a love for your child with those two things going for you, I'm tell you it can be done. And so I challenge every Christian here this morning to live what you say you believe, uh, especially your parents, uh, in front of old and young. If you believe that God answers prayer, then be an example in giving something to answer by praying for your kids and with your kids. For the Bible says that we are to pray without ceasing. Somebody say amen. If you believe that Jesus can take care of you, then stop fretting so much in front of them and begin to rely on Him and let them see that. If you believe that God's Word is a roadmap for life, then get in it and begin to read it instead of hanging out on Facebook seeking your advice among other people. If you believe that coming to church is what a Christian should do, then get up and get yourself here and be fed by the Word of God. If you believe that a Christian should respect authority, then you do the same. 
And if you want your children to be forgiving, even into adulthood, then when somebody offends you, you've got to model forgiveness in front of them. If for no other reason, it's the right thing to do. But also, your children are watching, and your children will inherit your principles. And speaking of principle, we act outraged, or we did. So many things, we seem like we're so far past that now. Christians act outraged when prayer was removed from public schools. But I dare say the majority of Christian homes do not have family devotions. We do not pray with our kids within the walls of our own homes. I'm telling you that is hypocritical. We act shocked that the Ten Commandments have been removed from the American courthouse. But is the Word of God posted in your house? And better yet, are you putting that, are you sealing that into the hearts of your children? One man, Max Jukes, did not believe in God, and he married a girl of the same opinion. From this union came 1,026 descendants. Studies showed that 300 died prematurely. A hundred were sent to the penitentiary. A hundred and ninety sold themselves into vice. A hundred were drunkards, and the family cost the state of New York $2 million. Another man, Jonathan Edwards, uh, believed in God and in his disciplines, and he married a girl of like character. And from that union, 729 descendants were studied. And they discovered that 300 of them became preachers. 65 college professors, 13 university presidents, 6 authors, 3 U.S. congressmen, and 1 became vice president of the United States. Folks, we need to teach our children that principles matter. Amen? Principles matter. We need to teach them that a relationship with Jesus Christ matters. And we need to teach them how to have healthy relationships in the home because relationship within your home matter. Amen? I'm telling you today, the home is under attack today like never before and the importance of loving, spirit-guided Christian relationships has never been more needed than it is today. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, Jesus had something to say about those spirit-guided relationships, beginning with the husband and wife. And here's what he said. You both, turn to somebody and say, that includes you. You both will submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ. God said, if you love me, you'll love one another. And then he goes on to address the wife first. And these are Christian marriages now. And here's what he said. And by the way, I know this is not politically correct, but it is biblically correct, desperately needed, and it needs to be taught to our children. And here's what God says that a Christian home should look like. You wives should yield to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of his body, the church. He gave his life to be her savior as the church submits to Christ. So you wives must submit to your husbands in everything. Now I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that these cultural trendsetters out there are attempting today to blur and erase all the differences between men and women today. But God clearly recognizes that there are differences. And he says there are some obligations that go along with those differences. And then he speaks to the husbands, and here's what what he says to the husbands. Husband, you must love your wife. David, you must love your wife. Alex, you must love your wife. Brian, you must love your wife. All of you gentlemen out there who ever expect to be married, who are married now, it is not a suggestion. It is a command. Men, buck up, buttercup, and love your wife. Somebody say amen. Okay? We must love uh, our wives as Christ loved the church. Uh, with the same love God Christ loved. Now notice, that's not a reciprocal love based on how she treats me. But it is an unconditional love that mirrors the love that Jesus Christ has for us. He gave his life for her, verse 26, to make her holy and clean, washed by baptism in God's word. He did this to present her to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she is to be holy and without fault. And he goes on to describe this kind of love that men are to have for their wives even further because you know what we're guys and we need a little extra direction and so the Lord puts that in here for us beginning in verse 28 in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as they love themselves 
For a man is actually loving himself when he loves his wife. Nobody despises their body or hates their body. No, they care for it. Just as Jesus Christ uh, uh, cares for his body, which is the church, and we are his body. Verse 31, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his mother and father, and he will be joined with his wife, and the two are to be united as one. It's a great mystery, but it is also an illustration of the way that Christ and the church are one. A husband and wife are to be one. So again, I will say this. Each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I want you to hear that, and I'm so glad you came to hear that. And if you don't come back to church for another 10 years, you just got something that's good. I'm telling you, that was worth the trip in here today because you will not hear that any place else today. That is God's formula for a healthy Christian home. And we need to teach it to our children. We need to teach them that a relationship with God matters. We need to teach them that family matters. And we also need to teach them that responsibility matters. Ours is a culture that has become experts at playing the blame game. Everybody today, no matter what it is, uh, we want to blame something or someone for our problems. It's because of my color, my ethnicity, my gender, my politics, my environment, my religion. But I'm here to tell you today that God's children must understand that we are to be accountable to, uh, for ourselves uh, and we must take responsibility for our own actions because all of us as God's children are going to stand someday before Almighty God and give an account not for the poor behavior of others but for the actions of our own. Uh, here's the second thing I want to lay on your heart this morning. Not only will your children inherit your principles but your children will also inherit your priorities. Where do your priorities lie? I'll tell you where you can always find them, wherever your treasures are stored up. Teach your children the right priorities. Begin with teaching them the priority of truth. Teach your children the priority of truth, ladies and gentlemen. God tells us in Matthew 6, 19, do not store up treasures in heaven where moth and Peter, you and me are fighting over two and three. <laughs> All right. Do not store up treasures on earth where moth and rust uh, can corrupt and where thieves can break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust will corrupt and where thieves cannot break through and steal. Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Colossians 3, 2 says this, Set your firm affection on things above and not on things on the earth. And Mark 8.36 said this, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The truth is that there is nothing here on earth that has the ability to make us permanently happy. But there are many things in earth that can get us entangled, that can tie us up and cause us to be forever regretful. And so teach them priorities, the right priority, the priority that we need to chase God first and all these other things will fall into place. Teach them the priority of forgiveness, folks, or, or togetherness. You know, there are a number of things that are, that, are, that are having a negative impact on children today, but none so much as the uh, breakdown and breakup of the family and of absentee parents. Uh, we need to pass on to our children the importance of being together and the importance of, of family and teach them the importance of time. It's been said, I know, when it comes to kids uh, that oftentimes it's not about the quantity of time, it's really about the quality of time. Because we don't have a lot of time today, it's a busy world, and so even if I don't have a lot of time, if I spend good time when I have time, well then that makes up for the fact that I don't have a lot of time. Let me help you out with that. That's an absolute lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. You want to know how children spell love? T I M. E. That's how they spell love. Time. There's a famous song of one man's journey through life. Maybe you've heard it. One of my favorites it, called Cats in the Cradle. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. But there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it. And as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. 
and the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you coming home, Dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. You want to play? He said, I can't. Not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. That's okay. He walked away, but his smile never dimmed. He said, I'm going to be like him. You know I'm going to be like him. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When are you coming home, Dad? I don't know when. I'll tell you what. We'll get together then. I'll throw you the ball then. <laughs> well, he came home from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, Son, I'm proud of you. Have a seat. You sit for a while. He shook his head, and then he cracked a little smile. He said, what I really like, Dad, is them car keys. What I really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Could I have them, please? And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. What happened to it? When you coming home, son, I don't know when. But we'll get together then, and we'll have a good time then. I've long since retired. My son has moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. And he said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could just find the time. You see, the new job's a hassle and the kids got the flu, but it's been sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. As he hung up the phone, it occurred to me. My boy had grown up to be just like me. My boy was just like me. The cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue, where'd it go? And the man in the moon. When you coming home, son? Well, I don't know when. We'll get together then. And boy, we'll have a good time then. Be careful how you live. Because sometimes then goes by awful quick. And before you know it, then is it used to be, it was. Your children will inherit your priorities. Here's one more thing I want you to know this morning. Your children will inherit your practices. What kind of impression are you leaving on your children by, the, by your actions? You want me to tell you what will happen when your walk doesn't match your talk? Your children will grow up to be just like you, or they'll rebel and run away from everything that you were, or maybe even the new you that you have become, even if it's a change uh, for the better. You see, the, it, it is foolish to think that we can live one way and expect our children to live another way. If we attend church regularly, more likely than not, our children are going to attend church regularly as well. If we pray regularly, more likely than not, our children will grow up and learn to pray regularly as well. However, if we live for ourselves, more likely than not, our children will grow up and do the same. You see, if we're a lazy drunk who cusses like a sailor and runs around uh, acting a fool, our children will probably grow up being affected by those things uh, and inherit some of those things as well. In fact, statistics show this, that, that children of alcoholics are four times more likely to become alcoholics than non-alcoholics. The playground one day, a woman sat down next to a man on the bench. She said, that's my little guy over there coming down the slide. He said, well, he's a good looking boy. He's a good looking boy. That's my son over there on the swing. Ah, good looking. And they just sat and watched their kids for a few moments. Soon the man called to his son, let's go buddy, time to go. The little boy replied, uh, pleaded, just five more minutes daddy, just five more minutes. Benjamin has this saying, he wants to watch octonauts. And every time I go to turn octonauts, he always says before the end of octonauts, he gets so nervous, grandpa, another one coming, another one coming. Not a one coming. Let's go, buddy. And his boy pleaded, just five more minutes, Daddy, please. 
The man nodded and the little guy continued to swing. And a few months later, a few min- a min- a minutes went by and the father again calls to his son. Let's go, buddy. Time to go. Another one coming. And again, the little guy pleaded, just five more minutes, daddy. Just five more minutes. The man smiled and nodded. Okay. The lady sitting next to him couldn't believe what she was watching. She was more of a disciplinarian and she said, well, you know what? You sure are a patient father. The man smiled and nodded. I haven't always been that way. My oldest son, Jimmy, was killed by a drunk driver last year while I was, he was riding his bike near here. And to be honest with you, I've been so busy in my career, I didn't get to spend much time with Jimmy. And I'd give anything for just five more minutes. And so I promised myself that I would never let that happen again. And so he thinks that he has just five more minutes to swing. But the truth is, I get five more minutes to watch my little guy play. Somebody say amen. Amen. In closing this morning, I want to challenge all of you to reflect on the relationship you have with your children. Young and old alike. How is it going? The relationships that we have with our kids are some of the most precious, and yet they can be some of the most painful, but they are also some of the most important relationships that we have on earth. What are your children inheriting from you? Is your faith the way that you would like to pass along to your kids? How about your priorities and practices? Would you be proud of your kids doing the things that you are doing? You know, my friend, if you're unsaved this morning, the most significant thing that you could do is to get things right with God beginning right now, right here, today. If you're saved, the most significant thing you can do is to continue to follow the Lord and to serve Him with gladness and to set a great example for your family. And if you have backslidden, and that's okay, it's not what's happened, it's where you're headed. If you're backslidden, folks, the most significant thing you can do is to realize that, come to terms with that, and get back to where you need to be And all God's people said. Amen. Bow your heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have this morning to focus uh, on the responsibility that we've had. We've been given the gift that we have been given to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. For some here, we have adult children, and we feel like possibly that that has passed us by, but remind us, O God, that it is not. Although the dynamic of our relationship may have changed, we are still a parent, and we can influence and counsel and pray for from afar. God, thank you for this gift of family, and I pray, Lord, your blessing upon it today. In Jesus' name, amen.